My name is Arlene Hurston. The name of the show is Getting to Know You, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Tonight, we're going to get to know a man who has ridden the roller coaster of fame and fortune. He's experienced the best and perhaps the worst of life. He was one of America's most loved and famous singers, the little kid with the big voice. He became a millionaire, married three beautiful and successful women, Debbie Reynolds, Elizabeth Taylor, and Connie Stevens. He was at the top of the world, and then he lost it all. But now, happily, he's back with a new lease on life and is determined to make it to the top again. He's Eddie Fisher, and let's get to know him. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I'm really glad that you're here. It's nice to be here. here. Finally, Arlene, yeah. we got together. Right. Okay, we've been trying to do this, but as long as we yeah. did it, I'm happy. And I've had an opportunity to read your book. You wrote a book uh, about all the good things and all the bad things that happened in your life. I've only known about the good things. I found out about the bad things because of, of, of the book, and hopefully they'll all turn into good things. But why well, there did were, you... There were a lot more bad things. I, I left some of them out. <laughs> well, well, why did you decide to, to write a book about your life? I don't know. I really, um, now, in hindsight, um, even though there are a lot of good reasons why I wrote the book, I, I wish I hadn't <laughs> written it because it's brought up so many things that, and uh, they have been the, uh, the focal point of questions that people ask me, you know, the, the very devastating things and tough things to, to talk about, especially on camera like this. But um, all in all, um, the book and uh, and this roller coaster ride I was on, I've had a, an extraordinary life. I've had a wonderful life. I mean, uh, whatever happened in my life, I'm I'm probably among the luckiest people that ever lived to be here sitting talking with you okay. for what happened in my life. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, okay. Very well, happy. Yeah, you, Especially yeah. sitting in Skinny right. Zamata's backyard, <laughs> okay. Mr. AC. Right. <laughs> okay, which is where we are. We're in Atlantic City, and we're going to meet our host, Skinny D'Amato, actually, before the show is over, because I know that you love him, and he's a good friend of yours. And it's wonderful for him to have us here. But you were so frank in your book when you mentioned that there were some things you weren't so I happy wasn't about. Frank. Frank right. is Skinny's right. best friend. <laughs> right. Well, you were very honest in your <laughs> book. And you said a lot of things about a lot of people that weren't so complimentary. Did those people come back and, and, and have things to say to you that weren't so nice? Um, yeah. My, uh, let's see, my first, second, my third, my third wife was very upset. My ex-third wife, right. Connie, Connie Stevens, because I spelt Trisha Lee's name wrong in the book. Connie cried for three days and three nights. Okay, who's Trisha Lee? The, the, she's the baby. Me. She's my she's my youngest. She's 13. Oh, okay, Jolie and, Tr and Trisha, too. Uh, yes. All right, you spelled your own daughter's name? That wasn't your fault. I, I was the copy editor's fault, really. Yeah. But Connie blamed it on me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, people mad at you for a lot of <laughs> things. But actually, I found your book fascinating. We learned a lot about you. Uh, not all, I'm sure, but a lot. But one of your most famous songs, one of my most famous songs, but one of the ones that I like the best is Oh My Papa. And you sing Oh My Papa to me, he was so wonderful. Well, I found out in the book that wasn't true at all. Your father wasn't wonderful to you. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't his fault. It was the times. And my father was poor, very poor, and really worked his tail off for his big family. And, uh, he was, he was kind of, uh, you know, down, down and out, and it's tough not to be able to, to really do for your family what you want to do. He wasn't as bad as, uh, as you, as, as, as it finally comes out in the book. I mean, I, I love my father very much, but I didn't know it, because he was always yelling at me, you see. 
<laughs> beating the hell out of me, too. <laughs> for nothing. Oh, oh for nothing. For you nothing, never did no. anything wrong I as a child. I never did anything. Me oh. and Johnny Mathis right. never did anything wrong. <laughs> So that fact, Johnny Mathis was on the show also, but um, you've had everybody, yes, haven't you? Well, but now I have Eddie Fisher, which really makes me happy. <laughs> but uh, you, your mother was very important in your life. That was a good relationship, I, I guess. Oh yeah, well, mother and son is always a that's always a good relationship. It can be a marvelous relationship, and that's what I have with my mother. I'm very happy that I have my mother with me today. And she comes to almost every show I do, and uh, she's amazing. Yeah. She, I thought that she was the weakest one in the family because my father was, you know, the taskmaster, and she was a slave. You know, she did the washing and the ironing and the took taking care of the kids and taking care of him. And she did. I thought she was going to die when she was 40 years old, and she was 80 years old three weeks ago. Right here in Atlantic City, she came down. And we celebrated with Skinny. And, uh, <laughs> Terrific. She's, oh, she's, that's nice. She is one of the most marvelous people that ever was. Okay, and the mother of seven children, one of them, of course, of the most children. famous uh, being Eddie Fisher. You have made something like $20 million in, in your lifetime so far, just starting. But growing up in Philadelphia, one of seven children, it was obviously not an affluent family, from what I read in your book. Any, yes, it was the furthest thing from it, yes. What was it like? Uh, well, I knew that I wanted to get away from the poverty and the, the dirt and all the... Um, I really wanted to get, get out of Philadelphia, and I knew that I was going to get out because of my, uh, this frog I have in my throat. That's how I got out of Philadelphia. Yeah. Although I had a one, I had a wonderful time. I was on, on the radio. Uh, and I had three radio shows. I didn't have to go to school, or at least I thought I didn't have to go to school. I used to go up to the radio station and hide out in the uh, record library, you know, and listen to Como's records and Crosby's records and Sinatra's records, you know. And that's how I got my education. That's why I'm so smart. Okay, from not finishing high school, right? <laughs> right. Okay. We're gonna, I want to talk a little bit about the frog in your throat, but we're going to take a commercial break right now, and we'll be right back. We're speaking with Eddie Fisher. We're here in Atlantic City at Skinny D'Amato's house, and we'll be right back. Yeah. We're back with my very special guest, Eddie Fisher. We're here in Atlantic City in this beautiful surrounding, which is really nice. We started before the commercial break. You mentioned this frog in your voice, in your throat. When did you really realize that you had such a terrific talent? Well, I never thought of myself as having a, a terrific talent, but I, I was always singing. You know, I sang. I've been singing for 50 years, and um, I knew that I was going to uh, be a singer. I just knew it. I didn't want to be in a, work in a pants factory, but like my father <laughs> wanted me to. I want. I wanted to be oh. a singer. I wanted to get out of Philadelphia, and I wanted to be in show business, and I wanted to marry movie stars. Wow, and you did it all. Okay. Wow. All right. I didn't know how crazy I was. <laughs> but did it all come natural to you? Is it all, you know, easy once you started on the... It all, nothing came really... The singing comes came natural to me. I didn't know about anything. I was a very naive kid, and now I'm uh, a naive older man. <laughs> no, I... Uh, what was the question again, Norman? Okay, if it came easy for you. I really did have it easy. People think I, you know, struggle up, you know, the ladder. I, I, um, I sang all the time, and uh, I had good, good experience, and uh, had a lot of good friends that helped me along the way, and um, it's been wonderful. <laughs> I've had you know, ups and downs, but if you don't have those ups and downs, uh, that roller coaster, then you don't know how really wonderful yeah. life is and life can be. But what was it like, let's say, for instance, at the Paramount Theater, with thousands of teenagers, not just teenagers, all with thousands of people out there, screaming in, in admiration? I mean, what was that like? It was to, they're doing the, the uh, Claridge. Right. They're doing the Claridge. They're putting me on. Yeah. It was, no, it was wonderful. Okay. I, I loved it. I, I remember when I got out of the Army, in 53 and I was going to open the Paramount the next day. The, the same day, they wouldn't let me out a day earlier in the Army. They were strict. Two years, 
I got out April 10th, and they gave me my discharge papers when I got off the train. They wouldn't give me a day off in the Army. And, I, and it was raining, really pouring, and I thought, oh my, nobody's going to show up, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was really depressed until I started singing backstage, Thinking of You, which was my first hit. And then I heard these screaming teenagers, and then when I went out, and I tried to sing over them five shows a day, you know. It was really, uh, there's no way to express that kind of uh, uh, adulation. Could you call it adulation? Absolutely. That's Whatever. exactly what it is. But it, it was really fun. Now that I look back on it, I, uh, I wouldn't want it now. Why wouldn't you want it now? Well, I just would like Lynn to s sit down front and scream and you, ah. Oh. But she doesn't. She thinks I'm just a regular guy. Okay, when you're talking about Lynn, you're talking about Lynn Davis, who is your, your, your girlfriend, who's beautiful and talented. No, and she's charming. not my girlfriend. What is she? She's my love. She's your love. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right, well, you have had a lot of loves in your life. And you I talk have about not had a lot of loves. Had, well, a lot of women. Not as many as Skinny. Not as many as Skinny. We're, we're going to meet Skinny. I'm <laughs> telling everybody about it. We're going to meet Skinny. Okay, your, your first wife is Debbie Reynolds. Let me see. Uh, okay. Yes, that's right. Okay, and there was this whole, you know, talk about you leaving Debbie Reynolds for oh. Elizabeth Taylor. Of course, but I, but however, in reading the book, I really, you really were going to leave Debbie Reynolds. I gather long before Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor really didn't have. Let's be nice to Debbie. Do. We were going to leave each other. Yeah. We went to Mickey Rudin, our attorney, who's now Frank's attorney, and we drew up the papers to get divorced. You know, and then we went to the house back to the. And she told me she was with child again. So I said, why did we go to the lawyers? Yeah. You know, why am I telling this on television? Did I write it in the book? You wrote it in the book. Oh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but um, so we, we stayed together um, till after Todd was born and uh, a little while and then, uh, then we how you say split. Yes, right. Okay, so it really wasn't Elizabeth Taylor that, that, that caused the split. No, Elizabeth, you Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor did not cause the breakup yeah. between Debbie and myself. Okay. You were married to Elizabeth Taylor, I think, for about four years. Three years. Three years. And a large portion of your book, really, is, is related to that period of time. Uh, we all know it turned out disastrously. If you had it... Well, well turn, okay. listen, you know, you cannot measure love in time. And right. they were a wonderful three years. Lynn, you don't mind my saying that, do you? Huh? Okay. It was it was a yeah. great love. I have a greater one now. Okay, now, but, but it was a great love. Uh, because I, well, the question was, and I think you probably answered it, but if you had it to do all over again, would you marry Elizabeth Taylor? No. No. No, I would not marry her. I'd have a lot of fun with her, but I wouldn't marry her. Okay. What was the? Best? I didn't know she fooled around so you didn't. much. Like, no, that's a. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, you know, speaking about, what, 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 I guess, that, 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 that her affair with Richard Burton, everybody knows about, but oh. I read in your book, oh, affair, I said that, I read in, in your book that you were the person that really put them together. It was your idea that oh. Richard Burton uh, being Cleopatra. Well, actually, I'm, I don't like to sound off about these kind of things, but I had uh, a great deal to do with Cleopatra. I had a, I had to do with her doing Cleopatra. I had to do with her getting a million dollars for Cleopatra. I had to do for, for Rex Harrison being in the picture. I had to do with Richard Burton being in the picture. I had Joe Mankiewicz brought in because I said the picture could not be done without Joe Mankiewicz, the director, writer, producer. Uh, he knew how to handle her. And uh, he was brought in for many millions of dollars. On my say so. Uh -huh. I'm sounding so, off. Right, that good. is the, that is the truth. Yeah, right. I'm and uh, I tried to get an Afghan in the picture, you know, because I wanted to give one to Elizabeth. You know, I said and this, they, they needed an Afghans. If you get me one of those Afghans, I'll get your Afghan in the picture. She could, I didn't get the Afghan in the picture. Can't see how that's going to fit in with Cleopatra. Right. Last Elizabeth Taylor question, because we're talking about Eddie Fisher, not Elizabeth Taylor, but. Just what was the best and what was the worst part about being married to Elizabeth Taylor? The best part was uh, 
What was the best part? Let me see. Yeah, that was the best part. Oh, no. <laughs> and the worst part was when uh, that fella uh, came along. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, Richie. What, yeah. Richie do you, do Baby. You, do you mean you can't think of the best part? Oh, it, we, had, we had a marvelous three years. Yeah. We did. Um, we, were, we were very good for each other for a long time. Very good. Uh, she was uh, one way and I was another way, you know. Yeah. And we were a good balance. Yeah. We were. And we were a good team for a while. And, um, but everything has to come to an end. As the picture I'm playing in soon, shortly, to be released, Nothing Lasts Forever. <sighs> okay, that's the name of the picture, and Nothing Lasts Forever, because we have to take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about the picture. We're back with my uh, very special guest, Eddie Fisher, here in Atlantic City. Uh, you mentioned just before, um, a little while ago, that you were doing a movie. Yeah, and I did I a little wanna... uh, cameo thing in a, a movie uh, called Nothing Lasts Forever. It's the Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live people, the original. Uh -huh. you know. um, and um, I'm going to do the theme song from the picture, Nothing Lasts Forever, which is very good for me. Yeah. To, it's very apropos. And uh, it's just a little uh, cute little bit that I, I, I don't think I want to give away. All right. But I do, I do, I, I sing in it, and, uh, and I have a couple of lines that are uh, very funny. And it's, it's going to be a very wild uh, picture. I, I play the part of a, um, a lounge singer on a bus to the moon. Oh, wow. Isn't that, isn't that terrific? Oh, yeah. Huh? All right, I want to ride on that bus. All right. <laughs> Nothing lasts forever. You have been married three times. You say you've been married three and a half times. Yeah. What do you mean three and a half times? Well, she was 20. No. No, oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. it, it, it wasn't a, um, a, it was a, um, a ceremony that took place and a supposedly ordained minister married us in Port Acidas, Baja, California. And uh, but it wasn't. It was not a um, a legal uh, marriage. Okay, but you didn't know that until well, you wanted to get divorced. <laughs> you thought you were married until it came time to get divorced. So I was married. I was married for about uh, seven and a half hours. No, no. You I think it was about four or five months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that was, um, uh, it was during a period of time that everything wasn't so rosy. I mean, Eddie Fisher has been on the top of the world, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm on the top of the world being here with you, and, 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 and uh, your voice to me is as good, if not better, as it was, Thank than you. it was then. But, uh, and I've heard you sing, and I can't wait to hear you again, but you speak very frankly about the bad times in your book. I mean, at that time when you got married for the, that half time when you weren't really married, things weren't going so terrific. That's right. You speak frankly about your problem with drugs. How did you get hooked? Oh, that's the story I've told many times. I, at the Paramount, I was singing you know, all those shows and trying to sing over the the Bobby Soxes, you know. I, I blew my voice, you know. And this uh, very good friend of mine said, I got a doctor that'll give you your voice back right away, you know. So we went to see this doctor and uh, he gave me a shot in the arm, and uh, he said, sing. And I, yeah, my voice came back. I, oh, I said, oh, this is for me for life. Yeah. And it almost was my life. Yeah. <laughs> OK, and, it, it, and you know, it was something that you depended upon from then on? Well, I, yes, I, I thought that um, this was very, very good for me. I didn't know that it wasn't, uh, uh, I thought it was he healthful, helpful, and there were vitamins in there. And this methamphetamine was the uh, the drug, and uh, we all didn't know how dangerous that was, and uh, just got caught up in it. And I thought that uh, at a certain point that I could never do a show without it. Mm. I, I got that in my yeah. great head, you know. Mm. But uh, it, it's uh, it was it was not true. But it was tough, really tough, getting off it. It wasn't that I was addicted to it. It was that I. Um, it became a part. Of, it became a part of my um, pattern, and I would not. I used to hold up a show sometimes before I'd go on for two hours, waiting for the doctor to come to give me a, an injection. Mm, you know? Okay, because you depended. And I really didn't need it. Yeah. 
but it took an all, awful long time to, what do you call it, down, come down after I stopped 10 years ago. Okay, that's Hi, Frank. outside, <laughs> an airplane flying by. <laughs> okay, it was 10 years ago. How did you stop? I mean, when you become, even if you weren't addicted, you would depend on it. There was a How guy you... named Jack Kelly, who was a cop here in Atlantic City, who later became deputy commissioner of uh, dangerous drugs and narcotics for California, Nevada, and Hawaii. And he came to my house in Bel Air one time on uh, Stone Canyon Road, which is very apropos also. I shouldn't make fun. I really shouldn't. It's serious. And he came to see me one day. We were good friends. And um, he looked at me. He says, I give you six months. I thought he was going to put me in jail for six months, you know. No, he meant I give you six months to live. Yeah. Then we moved into the house. We moved, and he took me in front of a mirror. He said, "No, I'll give you three months." And that was the, that was the beginning of the end. That's when I started my uh, uh, road off of methamphetamine and all the other junk that I was taking. And that was pretty tough. Oh, I would really, think Really, so. really tough getting off because. Uh, I had been on it for a long time, but um, I now have the heart of a 21-year-old. I'm singing better. I'm very healthy. I've got the most beautiful girl in the world, the smartest girl in the world. How else would she? She wound up with me. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Her name is Lynn Davis. Okay. Is that her and name? She, yeah. Well, well, you know her name, but for those in the audience that, that don't know her name, and all you know, beautiful, intelligent, smart, but more than, loving. Uh, she did a, an awful lot of things for me. She, she really brought me back to life. Did she? Did yeah, she did. And a lot of other ways we can't talk about here on television land, but we can tell you about the part where she worked with me on my book. And uh, I can go as far as to say that if it wouldn't have been for Lynn, I don't think the book would have come out because there was a lot of things in there. There were a lot of things in the book that I would have left in, and I wouldn't be sitting here right now if they were left in the book. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, but you left in a lot, and you no, shared a lot. No, but she is greatly okay. responsible for the editing and uh, a lot of the writing, and um, she was more than a helpmate. Yeah. You're my everything. Next to Skinny, Lynn. Next okay. to Skinny. We're going to take another break right now and take time out for a kiss for Lynn. We'll oh, be right really? back with Eddie Fisher uh, in just a minute. We're back with my guest, Eddie Fisher, here in Atlantic City on this beautiful day. You look terrific, I, I have to say. Do you take good care of yourself now as compared to those days? Oh, I'm a, um, as is per usual almost, I've gone completely the other way. I'm a I'm a health freak, uh -huh. you know. And I and uh, when I got off of drugs, I got I got addicted to another thing, junk food, and I got up to 170 pounds. So then I went to a nutritionist, and a metabolicist, and all that. And I know a lot about food. Now I can't put on an, any more weight, so I'm skinny. Is, <laughs> You're hey. pretty good. No, I'm not skinny. Yeah, all right. Just what would you like people to remember most about Eddie Fisher? I don't know. You don't know? I really don't. I, I don't know if I want to be. I won't be remembered for, oh, you know. Oh, yes, you will. Maybe for about <gasps> after tonight's show, closing night. I want to be remembered as Skinny's friend. Okay, well, I'm going to remember today, and I'm going to feel that, that you're my friend, and I thank you very and much also for I being here. And also, that yeah. you're my friend, and that you thank interviewed you. Perry Como. Oh, oh and I, I interviewed never heard. Eddie Fisher. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed getting to know Eddie Fisher. I know that I certainly have, and that you join us again next week. Meantime, good night. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. We're going to do again next week? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you.